Well, here I am in my tubby again, and my tubby's all filled with water and nice fluffy suds. And I've got my soap and washcloth to wash myself, and I've got my nifty scrub brush to help me scrub my back, and I've got a big fluffy towel to dry myself when I'm done. But there's one other thing that makes tubby time the very best time of the whole day. And do you know what that is? It's a very special friend of mine, my very favorite little pal. The year is 1940. Peter Ganin, a 40-year-old Russian-American man, makes his living as a sculptor and toy maker. Ganin typically makes chess pieces and small sculptures of animals like the one seen here. These designs would often be patented, mass-reproduced in plastic, and sold for practically nothing. On December 29, 1947, Ganin submitted an application to the United States Patent Office for a 14-year patent on a toy design for a somewhat familiar-looking waterfowl. This, of course, would become the iconic design for the rubber ducks we know today. However, the ones we use today aren't actually made of rubber anymore, but instead a rubber-like vinyl plastic material. Originally, they were made out of vulcanized rubber, which was, unfortunately, not buoyant in the least bit, and intended to be sold as a chew toy. Regardless, the toy was an almost instant success, selling over 50 million according to the Los Angeles Times. Since then, rubber ducks have become almost synonymous with bath time, climbing to iconic status in pop culture all over the world, transforming into the bath time staple they are today. My best friend and my ex-best friend and rubber bath toys! Tell me, what exactly is the function of a rubber duck? Oh, um... Don't worry, Marge. Me and Terrible 2 here are gonna win that computer for you. How can you be sure? Because he wants it. Nowadays, rubber duckies come in what seems to be every theme, collaboration, and variation conceivable. No matter how weird or obscure it is. Needless to say, people really love their rubber ducks. Which brings us to... Being the icon that they are, it's no surprise that to this day, thousands of rubber duckies are being constantly shipped all over the world, bringing joy to thousands of bathers every day. However, not all on their courageous journey make it to their final destination. On the night of January 10th, 1992, a 98,000-ton container ship called the Everlaurel was headed from Hong Kong to Tacoma, Washington. While in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, passing through the International Date Line, the Ever Laurel, along with all its crew and cargo, found itself right in the center of a nasty storm. While being thrashed back and forth in the waves, the Ever Laurel lost 12 40-foot containers into the sea. Among those 12 containers, one of them somehow burst open, releasing its contents into the raging Pacific. The container, owned by a company called The First Years Incorporated, contained approximately 28,000 rubber ducky-based toys, including red beavers, green frogs, blue turtles, and of course, the original yellow rubber duck. The toys were released into the world, drifting endlessly into the open waters of the Pacific, never to be seen again. Or were they? James Ingram and Curtis Ebermeyer, two oceanographers taking on a rather ambitious goal, that goal being trying to create a map of the Earth's surface currents. Normally, their method for collecting data consisted of releasing between 500 to 1,000 of what are called drift bottles. These were essentially pirate-style messages in a glass bottle, with the words, Break Me, able to be seen on the paper through the glass. The flyer inside contained instructions on what to do after finding one, as well as informing the finder on the nature of the study, even sometimes offering a financial reward for finding the bottles. However, only about 2% of the bottles released ever made it back, making gathering significant data for the study seem impossible. But after hearing about the Ever Laurel incident, Ingram and Ebbesmeyer kept a keen eye out, knowing that eventually the ducks would make their return. On November 16, 1992, approximately 10 months after the ducks were initially released, a local beachcomber in Sitka, Alaska found 10 toys that were confirmed to be a part of the spill, nearly 2,000 miles from where they had originally started. After getting word of this, the pair contacted the locals and beach workers and managed to locate hundreds more of them along a 530-mile shoreline. 
Between November 28th of that same year to August of 1993, 400 of the ducks were discovered along the eastern coast of the Gulf of Alaska. After logging this information into a simulation of surface currents that uses information of air pressure starting from 1967, Ingram was able to use the data to accurately predict where many of the remaining toys would show up. Using their simulation, Ingram and Ebbesmeyer developed a model that led them to conclude that most of the floaties will travel the following route. First, to Alaska. Then west to Japan. Back to Alaska. And finally, drifting north through the Bering Strait, only to become trapped in the Arctic ice. Ebbesmeyer and Ingram predicted that it would take about six years before the toys would be thawed out and continue their journey. This story gained so much traction that in 2003, the first year incorporated actually offered a $100 savings bond to anyone who could recover any floaties in Iceland, New England, or Canada. More and more of these toys are turning up every year. However, these days, due to exposure to the sun, the ducks and beavers have faded to white. But with every toy that turns up, it has taught us more about how our ocean's currents work than any study has before, leading to what is most likely the greatest accidental study ever created.